it's not foreordained that the Europeans are going to uh, take over the world. Dr. Hoffman, it's a pleasure to have you in our program. Thank you for taking the time for this conversation with me. Okay. Uh, let's begin our conversation with your book, which is titled, Why Did Europe Conquer the World? What I'm wondering is, <laughs> um, if not Europe, then what other powers or regions could have potentially, quote unquote, conquered the world? Okay, I mean, we're talking here about the the period of conquest, by and large, but not exclusively, by Europeans, um, from the 15th century on up to World War One. Yep. And this sort of conquest, if you think about it, it's not the first episode of conquest. There are earlier ones. Think of the Roman Empire. Think of uh, Genghis Khan. Think of the expansion of the, the Persians and so on and so forth, Mughals and all, there are loads of conquest. Um, the earlier conquests and even some of the conquests in this period typically involve horse, um, archers on horseback who could cover enormous distance. That's, that's true for Genghis Khan. Uh, what about the Europeans? Yeah, in what about the Europeans? Yeah, from the 15th century on, they expanded using the gunpowder technology. Well, what do I mean by that? But it's a technology of using gunpowder weapons. Uh, these weapons had been first created in China. They were used throughout Eurasia, Europe and Asia. Um, and they were ideal for conquest because they allowed a small number of people to attack and, more important, defend themselves against a much larger force of, of people. You can, you can think of uh, Cortez, the conquest of the Mexican Empire. That's so a great I mean? example. Yeah, talk yeah. about a small number of people. Yeah. So what do I mean by the gunpowder technology? It's, it's not just firearms and gunpowder or cannons and gunpowder. It's a technology broadly defined that includes ships armed with cannons that includes fortifications that could withstand cannon bombardment it involves siege methods that allow armies actually to attack and take those even those improved fortifications and all the techniques of supply and so on and the continuous improvements in this technology plus older weapons that were really important, so sort of complementary factors. Uh, mounted soldiers on horseback with yeah. swords. Um, that was important for uh, Cortez. The, that even uh, continued through the Napoleonic Wars. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and, and then um, later on, this technology continually evolves over from the 14th century on, um, on up to the present day. Um, and um, this is striking because you don't see this kind of sustained technological change in other technologies. You see one-time improvements, but you, this is sustained technological change, which in other technologies really only comes in the 18th century and thereafter and involves scientific knowledge and, and its application and engineering and so on. Um, and that that works for for um, the gunpowder technology broadly defined. So that's a technology, and it allows small forces to um, conquer, but also to get a toehold. Think of the Portuguese in um, who arrive in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and conquer Malacca, modern day Malaysia. Um, with gunpowder weapons, ships armed with cannons, the first thing they do is build one of these forts. One of these forts that could withstand bombardment because um, the Sultan, Sultan of Aceh, who had 
gunpowder weapons would besiege them, but his his siege tactics weren't quite up to snuff. So uh, they they withheld this this fort withstood multiple attacks over the centuries, and it only fell when the Dutch arrived in the 17th century. Uh, so sort of really equal bad. equal level of technology, right? right. And mm-hmm. and and you see this repeatedly. This is a technology that's used throughout Eurasia and it's improved throughout Eurasia, but the Europeans improve it continually, the sort of unrelenting progress, whereas elsewhere in China, among the Ottomans, and the Ottomans are essentially the, the large state that expands from Western Asia and, and gradually conquers much of the Middle East, North Africa, and Southeastern Europe. Um, it's centered in Istanbul. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the outset, you mentioned two different things. You said archers on horseback. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm parsing that to two different uh, elements. I'm now interested in the horseback aspect, and you yeah. you, you actually um, focused in on the Mongols as one prime example of that. Now that we talk about Europeans, in addition to gunpowder, one of the market difference from my perspective is that they had ships. It was a different type of yeah. conquest and colonization that yeah. I think um, Asiatic empires or North right. Africa and, and, hadn't. And that's oh. essential. And it's essential for a number of reasons. It affects the Ottomans, but also the Persians, the uh, the Mughals, the the, yeah. the 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 Ottomans, Persians, the Mughals were were empires that sort of grew out of or included a large part of Central Asia, the the sort of Central Asian and Eastern European steppe, where there's grasslands, and in those areas, um, warfare by archers on horseback or cavalrymen, uh, armed soldiers with bows and swords or maybe lances. That was essential. They could cover an enormous ground. Think of Genghis Khan's conquests. Yeah. Um, But if that's a major part of your empire, you have to maintain a large cavalry force to deal with possible rebellions, to deal with possible attacks in those areas. And that was true not just for those three empires, the Mughals, the, the Persians, the, the uh, Ottomans, but it was also true for Eastern Europeans, for the Russians who arise and, and um, they, their major enemy initially were some, you know, nomads on horseback, the, the Tatars. And this, it was a problem for China as well. Their problem were nomads coming from Central Asia. So all of these groups had to maintain an army with a large number of cavalrymen. cavalrymen. Either that, or they had to hire someone to do it for them, or buy off the enemies. That, that, that yeah, mercenaries uh, or some yeah. sort of negotiation, and, which would only last for so long. That also meant, why spend on a navy? To answer your question, why build a large fortified navy? It's not... That's not your major enemy. Um, That's a fascinating point. Um, it it could partially explain why the Ming Dynasty didn't yeah. really spend uh, mothballed its magnificent yeah, exactly. ships. That's, that's why they mothballed Jung Hu's voyages. This this admiral who went on these they weren't voyages of conquest. They were voyages of armed diplomacy. We're going to yeah. show our force everywhere, but. They stop this in the middle of the 15th century because it's a waste of money. Our problem are the nomads from the north, from Central Asia, from uh, from the west, and to a lesser extent, this is a problem for the Ottomans. They have a navy, particularly a Mediterranean navy. Yeah, um, and that uses they arm these uh, the ships there were galleys. They armed the galleys. You can't put many arms on a galley, though. And there were limits to 
how far you could go with the gunpowder technology on a gal. You had to have a lot of space for water for the oarsmen. If you're all, you know, you're rowing a, one of these ships, you expend an immense amount of energy. You needed water and so on. Same was true for the Russians. They had a, um, a galley navy, uh, but they had to spend time fighting people from the steps. For, so for a long time, they too didn't spend money on a navy. So because, it's because that's not where the threat came from. It wasn't that's the not water. where the threat was, yeah. and that has big consequences for how far you're going to push the gunpowder technology. It's as if, well, we have to get horsemen, train them, and so on, or build forts out there to deal with the horsemen, not with people um, firing cannons. Two follow-up questions. Or um, Navy. Uh, or Navy, yeah. Uh, two follow-up questions. Um, you, you said that Europeans, unlike, again, Asiatic empires, um, continually improved on gunpowder. Yeah. Um, technology, and you're not the first one I've heard say yeah. that. Yeah. It's the continuous, sort yeah. of uh, incessant, if you will, incessant, unrelenting. Yeah. Exactly. It's elsewhere, it's up and down. And why wasn't that the case in, let's say, Ottomans, Persians, the Chinese, or the Mughals? We touched on some of it, but yeah. I want to go back and revisit. It. Why didn't yeah. they? I, I agree. It's it's partially spending less on this technology. Yeah. But it's partially also the intermittent, you know, we'll spend a lot on and we'll stop. It's true in China. Spend a lot in the, you know, the end of the Ming dynasty and the, you know, the late 16th and early 17th century. Yeah, yeah. And the early Qing dynasty from 1644 on. Spend a lot at the beginning, but by the, eight, by the 1700s, stop. If that, the answer to that question, why it varies so much it has to do with politics. And huh. there, there are several factors um, at play politically that determine when you'll spend and how much you spend. How much you spend has a lot to do with the nature of the enemy. But it all, that too has something to do with politics. So what are the political factors at work? I talk about them in my book, Why Europe Conquered the world. Um, think of the following thing. Suppose um, you have a bunch of small states that are fighting one another. You're in an area that's politically fragmented. And you're constantly at war. Like in you're Europe. Like, like Europe. You're more yeah. likely to spend continually than you will in a place where suddenly there's a large state that and that is a hegemon, a major power. No one will challenge that state. That happens at times when the Chinese empire is unified right? and doesn't face, you know, no one will, 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 will oppose it or someone will try. Like That's interesting. Japanese. That's interesting. Versus, for example, uh, the German states and principalities where there's so many of them yeah, and they're yeah. constantly and, fighting. Or another example. Big Japan. It was there was constant war until Japan was unified in the early 17th century under the Tokugawa shogunate. They advanced the gunpowder technology. Once they're unified under the rule of the shogun, spending on the technology and advances in technology stop. Now, what does this say, for example, about the Ottoman Empire? Well. It's constantly at war. So that's mm -hmm. not the answer for the, or, or almost constantly. So that's not the answer for the Ottoman Empire. Um, there's something else that's involved as well. To advance this technology, you have to spend a lot on it. You have to, you, you know, think of it as, as, and I talk about this in the book, think of each dollar you spend or whatever the currency is. Is giving you a like a lottery ticket. And the lottery ticket says, hey, I'm going to try this technology. And if it works, and I, I improve it, suppose I, I build a better cannon and that works. Fantastic. I've improved it. 
But if you don't spend much, you have fewer lottery tickets, fewer chances to improve the technology. So you had to spend heavily in that to keep improving it. Uh, that's one condition. Another condition is you had to be you had to be able to learn from others, from even from your enemies, what works. Um, the French do this. Go back to Europe. In the 18th century, their field artillery is miserable. Um, and they learn from the even from their enemies, the Prussians. Yeah. Um, and they improve it. And it proves very successful in the wars of the French Revolution under, among others, Napoleon as a general. So, so, so where are you going to learn from your enemies? And where and where are you going to be able to spend heavily? Uh, and where will warfare be interrupted, either because there's some because there's a hegemon, a major power? That helps narrow down where you're going to get progress. So, for example, as I said, with Japan, you get unification. Progress stops. Um, oh, fascinating. Oh, wow. Right? They're fighting. They're constantly improving. And then it stops. And um, same happens in China after the early 1700s. Right? Progress stops. Um, never stops in your... How about heavy spending? The um, Ottomans have a problem with this. Um, as do the other Central Asian empires, the Mughals, uh, the Persians, they have, they not only have to fight against um, archers on horseback or, you know, horseback fought warriors, and therefore have to spend on things other than gun powders. That reduces the number of lottery tickets they get, to, to take my analogy. Yeah, They're spending yeah. less on it. But they also have a problem collecting taxes. In these enormous empires spread out of a large area, they have a, a problem with tax revenues. So the Ottomans, for instance, collect much less in tax revenues than their um, European enemies, the Russians, for instance. Well, the Russians are a bad example. They, they can just draft serfs. But the Austro-Hungarians, they have much less tax revenue. So that means less spending. Um, and you find the same thing after the collapse of the Mughal Empire in, in India. Uh, there's an enormous problem collecting taxes. So there's constant warfare in India in the 1700s, but tax revenues are low, so you get no progress in the gunpowder technology. And, and it, it may also be harder, finally, to learn from, from others, particularly from your enemies. If the enemies are far away, that's true for China. Um, if, the, if the leaders in this technology are from in Europe, um, although they do learn from Europeans. And it may be, it's less of a problem though for the Ottomans. So it's, it's more a question of tax revenues, the nature of your enemies uh, that, have, that sort of limit progress in this technology uh, for uh, the Ottomans, for instance. Um, in the case of the Chinese, um, another element, perhaps even with um, uh, empires in India um, and Central Asia, was that uh, learning from your enemies may have been limited because they too are not technologically advanced in the art of warfare anyway. Yeah, yeah, particularly in this technology, in the gunpowder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the 15th century, during the latter decades of 15th century and perhaps into the 16th century and on, was it a foregone con conclusion that Europe would conquer the world? No. No? Okay. No. Um, now, if, if you say, well, Who's going to advance this technology? And you say, well, you have to have certain political conditions, no hegemon, constant rule, um, learning from your enemies. And that was easy in Europe. The distances were small. Um, it may have an advantage, but it's, it's not necessarily 
Um, the, the, you know, it's not foreordained that the Europeans are going to uh, take over the world. Um, and uh, um, the, the, you know, you, you could think of, we talk about this later, other possible group civilizations that could have done this. I suppose at one point you could have said the Chinese. And the yeah. something. Um, how about the Japanese? Exactly. And I do want to talk about it. So let's yeah. take a break here. We'll be back after a short break and okay. talk about the Middle East. We'll be right back. 